Good morning, Compassion. Please stand with us as we worship the Lord. Are you excited to be in the house of God this morning?
Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you are our peace today, God, and that you are our provider. We magnify you this morning, God. We bring all honor and glory to your name, Jesus. Man, God has just been on the move here at Compassion over the last couple weeks. We had just an incredible Easter uh, service, uh, six services, actually. It was crazy. Uh, it was amazing just to see what God was doing. And uh, last week, we celebrated and worshiped with some baptisms, and we're going to continue doing that this morning. As you can see, the tank is here ready to go. The prayer team's going to be up here. And uh, if you're here to get baptized today, just to invite you to come on and get in line as we continue to worship God and uh, bring glory to Him through people making that public declaration today of what God's doing in their life by getting baptized. And as, as they do that, we're going to introduce an original song for our church this morning. And the vision behind this song was just to bring glory and honor to one name, Jesus. There is one King that one day the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And it's not any other king on this earth or any king who's ever going to live after today. It's only one king and it's Jesus. Amen. So join in with us as, as we teach you this song this morning. Sing with us. No other name. Jesus, only Jesus. 
Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. Oh, I never can walk out that I put my faith in Jesus. Oh, he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations as he is. So I would keep him now. He won't. Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I build my life on Jesus. He's never let no, he hasn't. He's
Let's lift up some praise to our God. Firm foundation, so faithful to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Yes, we glorify you, Jesus, and we thank you that there's no storm we can't face. There's no difficulty we can't walk through when our lives are built on the solid rock, that firm foundation. That is Jesus. Thank you for being that for us this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. So good to worship with you. Hey, take just a moment. Find somebody around you, go greet them this morning, and uh, say hello to somebody before you take your seats. Go ahead, guys. Good morning, church. Happy Lord's Day, Compassion Church. Man, we're so glad that y'all are here. What an amazing day to see life resurrected as the old goes down and the new comes out clean. Man, that's a day to celebrate, is it not? What a beautiful worship that we've had. We're going to continue in a time of worship, but it's, it's moving into our times of tithe and offering. Behind me, you can see the ways to give here at Compassion, as always. Today, I'm super excited. We get to carry on some celebration into a time of tithes and offering to share a testimony from our uh, God's Guarantee. That was several months back. I think we started in November. So it's carrying over. We're still getting testimonies rolling in. We can't share them all. But this one, this one. I know God intended for me to share it with you guys. I know sometimes in our giving um, and in our praying and our obedience, we're just wanting God's timing to kind of speed up. We're like the drive through service. We want things when we want it. And sometimes we have to wait a little while. But let's be faithful in that waiting. Let's be faithful. These people, let me share this testimony with you. It says, my wife and I have tithed our entire married life 42 years. That's amazing. Yes, yeah, celebrate. Clap your hand for them. 42 years of faithfulness. He's saying God has always supplied our needs and then some because God's a God of abundance. He said two years ago or five years ago, we sold our two homes. So five years ago, they sold two houses. A few days ago, we received an unexpected check in the mail from the company that bought our homes. That, that just blows my mind. Five years. The company said that they didn't receive their full market value during the purchase. What an amazing company, don't you think? Who does that these days? Five years later to say, man, you didn't get what you really deserved. So the check that they received was nearly the full amount of everything they've tithed all year long. Give a shout of praise to God for that. How amazing is that? Faithful tithers, five years after they sold their house. They weren't even expecting it. God's already blessed their life. And that's what he wants to do for each and every one of us. Man, are we faithful to God in that way? Are we faithful to God in our tithing? Just something to think about. Not that I, I don't want to make anybody feel bad or feel pressured, but just pray about that as I pray over our offering, as it's time to give back to the Lord everything that he's given to us. It's not ours anyways. It's all God's. To God be all the glory. Just think about that and just let him impress upon you 
what might be your part in today. God, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory today, God, in your house. We thank you, God, that we are able to be here, God, in this place, the freedom that we have in this country to gather here, God. But we thank you for the faithful tithers of this house, God, that this church is up and running and going, that the light bill's paid, Lord, the water bill's paid, the mortgage is paid, God, that we can gather here to not forsake the assembly, God, because there's something for each of us to gain here today and something for each of us to give here today. God, I pray a blessing over every giver in your house, every giver watching online. Speak to each one individually, Lord, each one. May it be their heart to be joy in their heart, Lord, to give back to you today. And I pray you bless them in the overflow and multiply the offering as it rolls in today, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Until we address these big elephants that are in the room, nothing is going to change. How many of you are ready for Elephant in the Church Week 2? Look at your neighbor right now and say, you came back. You came back. Last week we talked about politics. And how many of you were not here last week? If you were not here last week, raise your hand. If you were not, go to our YouTube channel, Compassion Church Dixon, and check that sermon out. I feel like that we really laid some clear uh, guidelines as Christians on how to approach this political season that we're already in, of course, we've been in it for years now, there's just been so much back and forth, but how we actually um, kind of approach this coming year. And uh, I, r I really hope that you look at that sermon, watch it, and if you enjoyed it, I I'm glad because you enjoyed the Word of God. We tried our best to, to make sure that, that we're Christians first, amen? Before we're red or blue or anything, Jesus bled for us, hallelujah. And we're going to keep that focus there. So uh, today we're going into week two. Before we get into that, I just want to welcome all of our guests that are in the room. If you're a guest in the room, viewing in online right now, come on. Give all of our guests and everybody a big hand clap. If this is your first time viewing in or first time being here, uh, we are in this series called Elephant in the Church. And we are talking about some hot topics Today is going to be no different, but we're bringing it back into the house. Last week, we talked about political parties. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about building your life on the church and not Jesus. And I think right now, we live in a, a spiritual culture, a, a Christian culture, especially in America, that our spiritual lives are built on what's happening in a building rather than on the Word of God. And we're going to have that conversation. But before we do, I want to just bring this quote back up from last week because I believe it's something that we all need to think about. Differences are inevitable. So when you hear me go through, I've got an illustration, the exact one that I had last week. We're going to go through that again. But when you hear that, I want you to understand that differences are inevitable. With what we talk about today, there's probably, not, not probably, there will be people in this room viewing it online that may not agree with what the preacher's saying from the stage. Differences are going to be inevitable, but division is a choice. Somebody said, well, why didn't you put unity there? Unity is a choice, because I wanted that word division in there because I think we choose to be divided, especially in the church. We choose to be divided. When Psalm chapter 133, it's a very short chapter, but here's what Psalm 133 says. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh my goodness, how good and how pleasant it is for all of us to come together and dwell together in division. No, 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 no. In unity, you go down, and it's only a three-verse uh, chapter, but if you go down at the latter part of verse 3, it says this, For there, when you start identifying in the text contextually uh, what there means, there is unity. For in unity, the Lord commanded the blessing life evermore. 
So what you and I have to make a decision on today is what we're going to build our life on, what we're going to allow to unite us, and what we're going to allow to divide us. So just like last week, we said that a political party, if you don't watch it, you're going to build your life on the political party. And, and whatever the political party follows, you're going to follow. It doesn't matter what the Word of God says. Okay, so today I want to just take a twist and a spin, and I want to talk about, I'm going to try to put this around about where it's not going to mess anybody's view up, but today I want to talk about how we can build our life on church, and if we build our life on church in general and not on Christ, the things that comes into our life and the things that divide us. So I've got a little illustration for us today. If I could go ahead and get my first box, that would be awesome. If I could go ahead and get my first box, that would be awesome. There he is. That was planned. All right. Not really. So here's what we do is we build our life on the box. What do you all think if I just step on this right now? Yeah, yeah I'm not going to because it would just crumble because that's what your life would look like if you only built it on the context of the church. I mean, you know, well, my church don't believe that. No, I don't care. All this kind of stuff. And then when you do that, I just want to highlight some things that begin to happen. Your church may be affiliated with a denomination or it may have a specific doctrine. Uh, for me, I was raised in a specific denomination. I'm not going to name it because I don't want you all to think that I'm making fun. I think every denomination, I mean, that's great. They've got structure and some things like that. I'm not against denominations. Some people preach against denominations. I'm, par, I'm licensed through a denomination. So uh, I, I get all of those types of things. But my life is not built on that stuff. My life is built on the Word of God, just like ours should be built on the Word of God. But when you join or when you're part of a denomination or affiliated with something like that, then that doctrine becomes the law. Well, what if that doctrine of the denomination leaves something out of the Bible? Well, it doesn't matter because this is what my mama always said, my grandma said, tell you what. You know, so we have those, those moments, right? And then when we start doing that, just different things begin to come up. And now, because of doctrine and denomination and things, we get to talking about the spiritual side of church and talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And have they ceased? Have they not? Has miracles ceased? Have they not? Well, you know, I don't care what your denomination says. What does the Bible say? Gifts have not ceased. Gifts are still in full function. Uh, especially in Pentecostal worlds or charismatic worlds, everybody just wants to talk about two of the gifts. They don't want to talk about the other gifts. Uh, they just want to talk about tongues, interpretation of tongues. Why do we not see it? And a lot of settings like that, you see that those churches are out of order when it comes to those specific spiritual gifts because most people are speaking in tongues in church. Uh, and it's their prayer language that God has given them. It's not the interpreted tongue, but they do it so that they can be seen, and it's just a show. I won't get into that, but if y'all want to talk about that one of the weeks, I would talk about it if you want. Guess we won't. Okay. Because um, that stuff, you get, is that stuff important? Yes, it's important, but when, when those things trump, uh, no pun intended, When, when the, yeah, I got, got some supporters back there. Uh, <laughs> when, when those things override, okay, uh, the, the, the focus of why Christ came. You do know that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. So when you're, when you're focused, and if I had a title to my sermon today, it may be lost focus. When our focus gets off, we start focusing on other things. And, and now we're build, building our life on church and denominations and doctrines and all that, and we're trying to figure out all the spiritual stuff in the church, and, and by the way, I, I've got a certificate, call me pastor, you know what I'm saying? And now we're focused on titles, and when titles don't matter, you, you're not going to stand before Jesus, and Jesus sees you walking up uh, to the judgment seat and goes, hey, 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 stop, everybody, the bishop just walked into the room. Nobody's going to say that. Jesus is not going to say that. It's not about titles. I, I was uh, meeting with a lady this week. I'm working with a college, Southwestern Christian University, and uh, I'm working with that college to develop a program from the ground up to take ministry students that are going through a four-year ministry degree, and I'm, I'm helping them to develop this system to where those ministry students don't sit in classrooms for four years, and then after the four years... They're introduced to ministry and, and get the tail handed to them, right? I'm trying to develop a program to where any ministry student within Southwestern Christian University can come through a process, 
get put in a local church while doing online ministry classes so that they can get hands-on experience in the local church, in the line of ministry that they are called to and getting a degree in, you know? So I'm trying to figure this stuff out with this, this college professor and this lady that's over uh, this specific area. And um, she, she asked me, she says, what, well, well, Pastor Grisham, Bishop Grisham, whatever, you know, what do I call you? And I said, call me Jamie. That's great. If you don't mind, because I'm not, I'm not wrapped up in all the title stuff. Some people would say that if you call me Jamie, it's disrespectful. Really, most of those people that say that probably carry a title themselves, and they want you to respect them. So anyway, that, that's another thing. It's not about titles, right? So, and once, once you start getting into everything, and then we're trying to figure out, that's why I wore a good uh, suit coat today. Because it's all about the attire. I can't believe that pastor preaching in a t-shirt and a chain. Who does he think he is? You know what I'm saying? It's, I, don't, I wear suit coats too. Don't hate, you know. Uh, but if we don't watch it, our focus begins to be on the attire. And, and then we see somebody walk in and then there's little gossip corners in churches. And this is the elephant in the church, right? There's gossip corners in the church. And now we're saying, I can't believe she wore that to church. <laughs> you know? I said something in the first service, and they told me not to say it in the second, so I won't. It was a little edgy, but anyway. Um, but maybe instead of making fun of everybody and how they dress, and you don't know where she was. I understand she was at the bar running around, but she hadn't, she hadn't had the upbringing that you've had. And she really doesn't, she don't even think by wearing something like that in the church. But now she won't come back to church because you're more worried about how her outward appearance looks than her inward beauty that God can see. So I think that there's a lot of things that we can think about and focus on in those things. Keep them coming pretty fast now at this time because then once you get wrapped up in all this stuff, then style and culture and you know, how you do church matters, you know, because it doesn't matter if we point back to the, to the Bible. We want to focus on everything like lights and fog and all that. Uh, I was at a conference one time I was teaching, or I was going to be teaching, and I was at this conference, and the opening speaker, uh, he taught, and everybody kind of knew what was happening at Compassion Church and kind of knows our style, our culture, and what we do and, and all of that. So I was sitting around these round tables, and this guy gets up, and he preaches, and he says, you know, it's not about skinny jeans and big screens and fog machines. That's what he said. And I'm like, he just called me out in front of everybody. What's wrong with skinny jeans? I mean, if you had legs like this, wouldn't you wear them? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Come on. Are you kidding? Jill's out. Jill says stop. <laughs> Look, she is serious right now. That is that look. I am so sorry. <laughs> but, but honestly, everybody kind of did an about face. They turned around, and they're looking at me, and people's kind of chuggling. And, and I don't, when people say things, and I hope you, hope you learn from this. When people say something that is against your opinion, don't get mad. Don't shut off. Don't shut down. Don't think that you're better than anybody else because you're not. But I'm kind of confrontational. I don't mind conflict. I'm cool, you know, because I'm not upset with you. But I just went up to the guy and I said, hey, man, I would never uh, go to anybody. Man, I, I just felt like you called me out. But I would never go to anybody and say, hey, because of your suit and your tie and your fluorescent lights, you can't reach people for Christ. We're talking about styles when people are dying and going to hell, man. Gosh, let's don't, let's don't worry about that. Don't get caught up in that, you know. So you got to think about those things. What is this one? Oh, because once you get into oh, all of that stuff, then you start becoming a consumer. And now everything in church is about you. Church was built for you, wasn't it? Church was built for me. Let's keep going. Come on, buddy. We're going to go quick now. Here we go. Oh. Hey, what is this one? Oh, self-righteous and hypocritical. Because once you start building your life on, on who you are and who you think you are and all this other kind of stuff, you become self-righteous and hypocritical, which all of this stuff just leads to one thing. And it leads to church hurt. And people get hurt in church. 
Now, I want to say this because I do understand people do get hurt in church. I said something last service, and I, I didn't want to correct it within myself, but I, I don't think it come out the way that I wanted it to come out. But uh, I made a statement that's still true. I, I believe it's true. Nobody's really ever been church hurt. The whole church did not hurt you. An individual in the church hurts you, and here's why that individual hurts you. Because of one of the things or something else that we've built church upon. That's why you're experiencing church hurt. Has anybody ever experienced, do you go, walk around and people's like, hey, I hadn't seen you in Walmart in quite some time. Why well, I'm Walmart hurt. <laughs> Never going into another Walmart in the whole United States of America. I'm done with Walmart. Nobody ever says that. And I'm not making fun of people because there are hurts that happen. There's, there's good spiritual people that say dumb stuff sometimes. There's good spiritual people that, and, and maybe they're not spiritual. Maybe, maybe they, they have the longevity in church, but they don't have the maturity that they should have in church. And they say things, or they do things, or they push you out, or they make you feel a specific way. But you can't go around saying that every church has hurt you, because every church hasn't. The church as a, as a whole hasn't hurt you. A few individuals hurt you, so now you're hurting. Does that make sense? And honestly, if we build our life on this, the church will always hurt you. But if you build your life on that, the church will never hurt you because Jesus Christ loves you and he cares for you. Amen? So you got to think about that stuff. Let's get that other box just real quick. And, and then I have another box, and I want to get to this. And I said I wouldn't take as much time. I want to talk about this box. Um, tell me what you think about this box. Anybody? You got anything about this box? What you think about that box? I mean, if you, if you think about it and you look at it, I, I want you to begin to, to think what does this actually represent? Because do you have an opinion of church? Do you have an opinion when it comes to denominations and, and the doctrine that you believe? Do you have an opinion on gifts or titles or an opinion on what people should wear to church and what people shouldn't wear to church or the style or the culture of church or an opinion on consumers and, and, and not contributors or being self-righteous, hypocritical, or church hurt? Anybody got opinions on any of that? Come on, yeah, yeah, quit lying, crazy. That's why they call you crazy because you lie in church. You got to quit lying to church. Yeah, we got opinions. All of us, we got opinions on all that stuff, right? How many of you got an opinion on this, on this box right here? Well, talk to me if you got an opinion on this box. It's what? It's messy? Did you say it was messy? Let me tell you what this, this box represents. This box represents true ministry. It's not It's not that. If we make it about titles, guys, we're, <laughs> we're way off. If we make it about the denomination that we're from and part of and all the stuff, we're way off. If we begin to make it about any of that stuff, we're way off. Because this is, this is representing people that have real issues. Hurting people. And from this moment on, I want to I deal with something that many, many cards came in on when we started asking, what do you think the elephant in the church is? So when you begin to break boxes like this open, you start seeing things like sex, divorce, difference between love and sex, same-sex relationships, Homosexuality, transgenderism, same-sex relationships, sex, same-sex marriage. Come on. Sex, marriage, LBGTQIA+. Here we go. Same-sex relationships, same-sex attraction. Do you see a common denominator here? These are people in our church. Here's another one. Same-sex relationships. I love this one. It says, this church is wonderful. I don't have anything that you guys haven't addressed. Praise God. <laughs> Good for you. And this is not all the ones, but, but look, homosexuality, uh, same-sex marriage, porn, uh, addiction, uh, sex outside of marriage, homosexuality, um, how Satan uses things, same-sex same marriage. I could just go on and on and on, right? But I wanted to focus on these two right here. These two rock my world. Here's the first one. 
I'm gay and need information whether or not I'll go to hell because of what I am. Goes on to say, I've been saved and baptized. I'm wondering if I will miss the blessing or am I going to hell? Okay? You can cut the tension in the room with the knife. So those of you that are viewing in online, you're going, it's a little quiet. Yes, it is, and it should be. So I, I want to address a little bit of this because I'm, I'm going to answer that question today through the lens of the Bible. Every one of us right now, you have an opinion. But your opinion does not matter if your opinion does not line up with the Word of God. God is not hate. God is love. We went over this last week. If I love you, I will tell you the truth. I will not lie to you. People who want to lie to you don't love you. They say they're standing for you, but they're standing against you. Because every one of us will stand before Jesus one day. I don't care if you like that, ver uh, that, that verbiage or if you believe that. One day we will stand and answer before God. So here's, here's how I'm going to answer I'm going to go into the next question in a minute, but just flow with me, okay? Number one, you are not gay if you've been saved and forgiven. I'm not looking for claps. So if you want to clap, save the clap for later, okay? And I want to tell you, this is, this is one of those comments that I may be on Hip Dixon later because of this, but I don't care. There is no such thing as a gay Christian. There's no such thing. Here's what you're doing. You are identifying with your behavior, not your Savior. You have put your focus on the wrong thing, especially if you say you have been saved. Especially, did you really understand what salvation was? Nobody goes around and says, well, well who are you? I'm a murdering Christian. I just go around murdering people. But I, Jesus loves me. Nobody says that. that. Would you think that that would be crazy if someone went around and said that? Yeah, because they're identifying with the struggle that they have, not the person who can help them overcome the struggle. Now, y'all, don't check out on me. I want you to keep on because now the person is trying to question. This is real ministry. This is what it's all about, guys. These are the things that we have to talk about in church. I know I could have took a Sunday to preach something totally different that made some of you stand up to your feet and clap and want to run around the church, made you feel really good today. But this is what people are dealing with. Will I be blessed? I'll tell you, Jesus is not like the government. You don't get a blessing voucher when you're not a citizen. Hello. You just don't. You, don't. you don't get this, oh, well, hey, you know what? You said a prayer and things are really good. I know your life didn't change, but you said a prayer just here, blessing upon blessing. There's nowhere in the scripture that says that. So we're going to come back, and I'm going to answer that through some, some conversations, some text. But then the second card says, because it ties in, okay, it's sexual immorality. It says, do you have to be legally married to have sex? And if you brought your kids in here, that's on you. It's not me. we got kids' church, and it's awesome. Once you have sex, does God see you as married? Which is probably, I don't know how deep this person wants to go, uh, but what they're probably saying is in the Old Testament, I think it is in Leviticus, it says that if a man has sex with a woman, he must marry that woman. So you've got to understand, even in Old Testament Scripture, it talks about how if, that, that's, that's the constitution of marriage, that, that's consummation of marriage is to have sex, right? So this is really good. Jill's on her phone. Jill's like, I'm checking out. This is weird. Uh, but the Bible talks about fornication. You can go back, read, read Hebrews chapter 13. Write these down because I don't, I don't have it. Hebrews 13, verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 36 through 38. It starts talking about some of those things. You can go back to uh, Romans chapter 1. You can see where when, when we go down a sexually immoral track in our life, there comes a point that God turns you over to your abased mind to your mind and all the things that you're going through, there's a time in your life that God will say, okay, 
They have chosen to do this. And it actually says in Romans chapter 1, it says that men started desiring men, women started desiring women. And actually, I, I wrote it down here in this. If you go all the way down, this is Romans 1, 24 through 32. But if you go down to the bottom, it says this. It goes through all of the, the different things of people, of, of, of how he's turned them over to this mindset that they have. Verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, these people know the righteous, righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Listen, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Not only are these people who God has turned them over to this mindset, to this, this is okay. This is where our culture is today. Not only do they do and practice those things, but they approve people who do. Hey, it's okay. I'll tell you right now, this church will always accept you for who you are. Always. I don't care who you are. You're lesbian, we accept you. If you're a homosexual, we accept you. If you're an adulteress, we accept you. If you've murdered somebody, and we've had people that's walked into our churches, that's murdered people. If, you, if you're a drug addict, we'll accept you. If you're a liar or a thief or whatever you say, we'll accept you. But I will never, this church will never approve of any type of sin. We're not going to approve. See, there's a difference between acceptance and approval. And that's where we get all jacked up, right? So, so when you think about... I'm gay, am I going to go to hell, or do I have to be legally married to have sex? All of these things are behavior issues, which is the deception of the enemy. He wants you to focus on your behavior, not your Savior. He wants you to focus on all the bad, all the negative, all the thoughts, all the struggle. He wants you to focus on all of that instead of the person that can set you free from all of that. Here's why. Because religion, look, religion, when you build yourself on this right here, it tries to change us from the outside in. So now we actually say, she looks like, have you ever heard somebody say that? She looks like she's got her life together. What does that mean? Because she don't wear what she used to wear to church, and now she's dressing a little bit different, more modest, and surely God has changed her life. You don't know that. When Jesus changes us from the inside out, God is not as concerned about your behavior as you think he is. He is after your heart. He's not after your behavior. That's why a lot of people, I literally yesterday, yesterday had somebody at the soccer field say, well, when I get my stuff right, I'll come to church. I said, girl, you better stop. You better stop. You'll never come to church. You ain't going to get your stuff together. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will not get your stuff together. Come on. You ain't going to get your stuff together. You'll never be okay. But I want to tell you, it's why we have a vision around here, and it's, it's this. This is the vision of Compassion Church in Dixon, Tennessee. To see lives transformed through encounters with the love of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, we know that your life will never be the same if we can get you introduced to the love of Jesus. Because when you, when you give your heart to Christ, you change. People say this. They say, well, pastor, how do you actually know? And y'all have heard me say this. How do you know that someone is actually saved? Here's how I know you're saved. You change. You can't, you can't say, just because you say out of your mouth, I've been saved. Good. So why are you still hanging around the bar? Why are you continuing? Because if, if you have been saved, Jesus has got a hold of your heart. And now in reading the word of God, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you don't have opinions of your life. You don't have the opinion of, of which direction your life is going to go. Now, now you are obeying the vision, the mission, the will, the call, the purpose that God has for your life. And you're obeying that and walking that thing out. you got to change. You say, well, you got to give me some scripture that says that. Okay, 2 Corinthians, here it is. Y'all ready? Therefore, if, somebody say if. If anyone, that means anybody. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. doesn't matter what your present looks like. If anyone is in Christ, in is a place. Christ is a dwelling place. He's not somebody that you visit 
once or twice every three to four months. It is a place, a 24-7 place. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So when the person is submitting a question saying, I am gay, no, you have gay behaviors. You, got, you have gay tendencies. If you have given your life to Christ, you are Jesus' child. You are a daughter of the king. You are a son of the king. So when you change that mentality and now you look at yourself different than what everybody else is saying about you, come on now, when you begin to do that, now your life begins to change. And you understand, ah, oh, I'm a new creation, but I still have these thoughts. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But here's what the word says. Old things have passed away. In other words, all that stuff that was in your life, it's got to go. Well, I don't have the strength. That's just trying to overcome me. There is no temptation common to man that, that Jesus hasn't been through. He's been tempted in any way, all kinds of ways. But I, I want to tell you this. He will give you the strength to overcome your sin. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's not one part of your life that doesn't become new with Jesus. So you go, well, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm this way and I'll always be this way. The devil is a liar. You don't have to always be that way. Well, how do I overcome this? I don't have all the answers, but the Bible has the answers. And if you'll let Jesus become the Lord of your life, he will lead you and guide you and direct you in the paths of righteousness. God never says in his word, get your life right and then come to me. Go get your life right and then come to me. He says, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm going to tell you, said that person that has submitted that question, your, your yoke is heavy right now and your burden is heavy. It, it's, it's actually your yoke is, is uh, 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 hard and your burden is heavy. And I'm telling you, there's a Savior that loves you enough that you apparently know about. You know about Jesus. Go all in with Christ. Get around people that are going in the direction that you want to go in. Quit hanging around. Look, if I'm gay, I, I can't hang around gay people. If I'm a drunkard, I can't continue to go to the bar. If I use, I can't continue to go down to the crack house. I don't care how much I love them. I don't care how much, man, they're my friends. I get it, but those friends are taking you places that God don't want you to go. What if you really go all in with Jesus and your life changes, and now your friends follow you instead of you following your friends? That can happen. We're over here worrying ourselves to death and trying to make something of ourselves. When Jesus said this to the disciples when he was calling them, he said, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But let's just focus on that. Follow me and I will make you. I'm trying, I'm trying to make something of myself. Stop trying to make something of yourself. Follow Jesus and he'll make you. Man, I just, I just don't know if I can overcome this. The devil is a liar. Quit speaking that over your life. I will always be this way. The devil is a liar. The power of life and death are in the tongue. Why don't you start saying, I know that I'm struggling, and I know I still have tendencies, and I know I still have horrific thoughts, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can, I can overcome. I'm a conqueror. I can be delivered from this because you can. And some people say, well, I, I just have thoughts, right? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 15, but I wanted to. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons we fight with, see, a lot of people, they're like, man, man I, I struggle physically with this thing. And, and we're talking about, you know, gay, homosexuality, lesbianism, you know, fornication, sexual immorality, those types of things today. But if you look at it in a practical sense, I mean, look at all the stuff around me and look at all the, the culture and what I see when I turn on the news station. And, and you're looking to, to deal with everything in a physical way and you think that you have to fight this physical battle with what you're struggling with and you don't. And here's why, because it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
uh, the weapons of our warfare are not within Fox News or MSNBC or CNN. That's not the weapons of our warfare. That, that's the way of culture in the world. But they're mighty. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So that thing has a stronghold in your life. And now the weapons that you're using, this is the sword of the Spirit, right? Breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth. I mean, you've got, it, it's crazy all of the things that we have at our fingertips. But go to verse 5 real quick. Look, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So when that thing begins to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, when that thing tries to trump keep using that word, but when it tries to overcome and it comes against the knowledge of God, you've got to bring every thought into captivity in the obedience to Christ. You, you've got to say, whoa, 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 nope, nope, I am no longer that man, I am no longer that woman, I will no longer have those thoughts. It doesn't matter if you have the same thought five minutes from then, doesn't matter. You start speaking over your life, I'll never have those thoughts again, greater is he, I'm telling you, Jesus, Jesus. Sometimes the only thing that you can say is Jesus, 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 Jesus. I promise you, in the middle of the night when you have thoughts of pornography and you want to get up and get on your computer or get on your phone, why don't instead of picking up your phone just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's no way that you can usher the presence of God into your room and watch anything. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've just got, I've got, I've got to believe in Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Am I with you? You with me? Okay. Because here's what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this includes a lot of things. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I don't care what anybody is telling you. I don't care what your denomination or your doctrine, because now we're, we're actually, uh, th this type of lifestyle is now approved in some circles and churches, and they're ordaining people who are going against the Word of God. I don't care what your denomination, your doctrine, any of that stuff says to you. Here's what the Bible says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And the unrighteous are not just people that's dealing with sexual sins, the unrighteous are people who are not in right standing with God. To be righteous means to be in right standing. When you come out of being in right standing with God, you are unrighteous. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Which I could go back to denominational conversations and we could start talking about once saved, always saved. And if I said a prayer when I was eight years old, I'm, I'm splitting heaven wide open, bless God. It is not biblical and that is not my opinion. Maybe that's one of the elephants we need to address. I'm not sure. But here's why. I'm saying all of this. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sexual immorality, right? Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites. Keep going, verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. It didn't just point out homosexuals. It didn't just point out fornicators. It pointed out a lot of things. And here's what we're doing. We're looking at that right there, and we don't really want to teach on this because we're in fear that people may leave the church. And when people leave the church, money leave the church, and somebody gets mad. Well, I tell you what, I would rather preach and pass pastor a church of five people and stand on the word of God than 5,000 people and have to water down the gospel. Because there was another card that was in there. If I would have kept on, I probably would have found the card. But it said this. It said, would you pray with me that my addiction goes away? And that addiction can be sexual addictions, that can be drug addictions, alcohol addictions, you know, porn, porn addictions. You know, would you just pray with me? But no, man, I can't. You know why? Because i got to have a meeting with somebody, and we're going to talk about style and culture. I ain't got time for all that. Oh, no, man, I, I just can't today because, you know, I, I, I'm dealing with some church hurt, man, and these people have been Christians for 43 years just trying to figure it out. Can't do that. I'll, I'll pray with you. I'll put you on prayer list. When true ministry is going undone because we're focused on the wrong thing, because people are hurting. Band can go ahead and come on out. People are hurting. They need the church. They don't need church hurt. They don't need judgment. They don't need hypocritical thinking. They don't need people looking over them thinking that they're better than them or self-righteous. Because most people, here's what I've learned in 20 years of ministry full-time. I have learned that most people who are shaming someone else has a closet sin that they don't want anybody to be uh, aware of 
So I'm going to go back. I don't think that I quoted this in the very beginning. Maybe I did. I'm not really for sure. But differences, guys, are inevitable. But division is a choice. I did quote that, didn't I? Yeah. But division is a choice. All of us have an opinion, even on what I just talked about. We all have an opinion, right? But the truth is, there's only one thing that unites us, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I'll do the same thing that I did last week, because when, when Jesus is the cornerstone of everything, then what happens is God comes in and he does the same thing, right? He knocks it all down, and then he says, if you allow me to be the firm foundation, then I'll build my church. He'll build his church. Give me one of those real quick. Come on. So if you would, stand to your feet today, and I'm going to get us dismissed here in about two or three minutes. Maybe four. Y'all give me grace today. I have found that these topics, it's hard to preach them in 25 or 30 minutes. And I'm sorry about that, but I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Right? But honestly, we did this last week. We partook in communion together last week, first Sunday of the month, and we always do that. But because of the topics and the things that we're talking about, I just, I just got to thinking, and I thought, I want to do communion again because differences are inevitable. But guys, division on any of the stuff that we talked about today, it's a choice. If you walk out of here and you're fired up and you're mad and you, you're never going to go back to that church again, that's your choice. We're just trying to unite ourselves in Christ. Christ is the firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. And maybe there's people in the room today and you just say, hey man, with some of the stuff that you're talking about, I've got caught up in church, I've got caught up in some of the things that's kind of going on and, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm needing to repent because <laughs> I've made this something that it's not. And we've got to go back and we've got to think and focus on this thing called people. So if that's you today, or maybe you have some sin in your life that you just, you need to confess to God, just bow your heads real quick. Let's pray a prayer, because the Bible says to get yourself right before you take uh, communion. If not, you'll drink damnation upon yourself. We don't want any of that stuff to happen. Father, you know everybody in this room. I'm not having them raise a hand today. You just know it. You know their heart for viewing in online right now. You know their heart. Maybe they're sitting in the tourney center. And, and you know their heart right now. They need to get some things right with you. Come on, say that prayer. Just, just say, God, I need to get some things right with you today. I just need to get some things right with you today. Forgive me of my sin. I've made my life into something that you never intended for it to be. So I repent of all of those things. I turn back to the cross and ask for forgiveness. Your will be done in my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God's good, ain't he? If you would today, this is a wafer representing the body of Christ. This is what unites us. This also is a choice. What are we going to focus on? Are we going to focus on all the issues and the topics? Or are we always going to go back to the Word of God and just point to the Word? Let's focus on the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. Then the Word became flesh. That was the body. Jesus is here because He loves you. He cares for you. He's forgiven you of your sins today. Let's unite in that. Father, thank you for this body. Thank you for everything that you did for us on that cross. In Jesus' name, take the bread. Father, this cup represents the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There's power in the blood. There's life in the blood. And Jesus, we understand that when we give our lives over to you, there's power in that. There's life in that. We give you praise for it. We take the cup today in remembrance of you. Take the cup. Come on, put that cup down and give God a big hand clap today. Come on. Give him some praise, church. Come on. Hey, look. If you're brand new to the church today, I'm going to be standing right down here around the front. 
And I would love, me, my wife, Jill, she's standing up here on the front row. We would love to just shake your hand and thank you uh, for coming if you're in-house today. Next week is going to be our Connect Fair. It's going to be popping around here. You're not going to want to miss it. We're going to be displaying all of our groups, all of our teams, all the ways that you can connect here at Compassion. We love you. Come back next week, week three. Who knows what we're going to talk about. It's going to be fire. It's going to be good. We love you so much. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Thank you.